Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Kent Island Innovation Event that we are hosting this year. Um, our event is a little different this year uh, than past years, but we still wanted to take the opportunity to celebrate our students and all their hard work. This year, once again, our engineering and biomedical science students came up with some amazing projects and innovations to solve some of the real world problems that are out there. Um, I hope you enjoy their presentations and learn lots and root for their bright futures. Hi, my name is Jillian Arlinski. And my name is Amara Crow. And my name is Lauren Tonelli, and together we designed an innovation using nanomedicine to treat spinal cord injuries. In the United States, approximately a quarter of a million people are affected by spinal cord injuries each year, with about 13,000 new cases every year. Of those cases, approximately 60% of those occur to individuals under the age of 30. These are young, healthy individuals ready to start a family and their lives. If we look at the graphic here, the orange line represents vehicle accidents. 53% of spinal cord injuries are due to vehicle accidents. These people do not ask this upon themselves. They simply get in a car and then this injury is upon them. The significance of a spinal cord injury is that it affects not only the spinal cord, but the entire body. The damage to the spinal cord affects your motor function, your sensory function, and your cognitive function. Recovery time for a typical spinal cord injury is about six months, but it can also take up to years, which would still leave a patient in a wheelchair. This is why we designed an innovation to help get those people back on their feet. Jill, I'm about to ask you to just talk about our innovation. Our innovation combines two approaches to use nanomedicine to treat spinal cord injuries. Our first step is the injection of 500 nanometer nanoparticles intravenously into the bloodstream. These nanoparticles are negatively charged and mimic the size of cell debris. Due to this, the immune cells in the body will engulf these nanoparticles and lead them away from the injury site into the spleen where they will be filtered out. This is especially important because when the injury occurs, there's an influx of immune cells into the injury site because the blood-brain barrier is destroyed. To stop this inflammatory response, we will inject these nanoparticles and there will be a more regenerative response instead. The second step is the injection of nanobubbles that carry the nerve growth factor. These are also injected intravenously. The nerve growth factor will be transfected into cells after the nanobubbles are destroyed by ultrasound irradiation. The nerve growth factor will help with axonal regeneration and cell growth to heal the injury site. Amara, would you like to talk about the benefit? Our innovation is non-invasive and inhibits cell apoptosis in the spinal cord after injury. It is a regenerative approach to treating a spinal cord injury and is biocompatible in the body. Patients suffering from spinal cords will eventually regain sensory and motor function in their body. Nanoparticles of amino acids increase the efficiency of the transfection of the nerve growth factor. In the future, uh, nanomedicine will be more available in medical practice, as in hospitals or doctor's offices. This innovation could also lead, potentially lead to other treatments in diseases in the central nervous system. Thank you. Hi. I'm Catherine Valentino, and our innovation utilizes CRISPR-Cas9 in nanoparticles to treat HIV. HIV is an epidemic because 38 million people across the globe are affected by it. HIV is spread when non-infected blood interacts with infected blood. HIV is a lifelong disease with currently no known cure. At the time, antiretroviral medication is the only treatment available, and it is a combination of medication that must be taken daily. However, if medication, a dosage is missed, the viral load can increase in a bloodstream, causing a person to either progress to AIDS or have a higher risk of transmitting the disease to another. Here you can see the HIV progression from very little HIV in the bloodstream up until AIDS where there's a high amount of HIV cells and less CD4 cells weakening the immune system and causing severe damage and not being able to fight off the infection. To combat this, we have created a one-time treatment known as nano-edits, which Nicole will explain for us further. Hello, I'm Nicole. So our nano-edit solution is a CRISPR-Cas9 packed nanoparticle. So this nanoparticle will be injected into the bloodstream and the nanoparticle will 
be guided to the CD4 immune cells. So once at the immune cell, the nanoparticle can easily enter the cell and the CRISPR-Cas9 guide RNA will target the CCR5 region of the genome. So this region codes for the CCR5 receptor expression on CD4 cells. So without this expression of the CCR5 receptor, HIV can no longer enter the CD4 cells. So um, Alex will now tell us about the benefits of this innovation. Hi, I'm Alex Torian, and I'll be telling you about the benefits and long-term implications of this innovation. So nanoparticles are a newer type of technology and can easily enter cell membranes of cells. Um, it can be a one-time treatment option rather than antiretroviral medication, which you have to take medication regularly. Um, it can reduce a patient's viral load to undetectable levels and reduces other people's um, HIV transmission. And it also can improve the quality of life, so medication will not need to be taken regularly and it can reduce depression and anxiety rates. And it can open up job opportunities for genetic surgeons or genetic engineers. Um, good afternoon. We are Easy Methods and we will be introducing to you a new way to diagnose early onset Alzheimer's disease, which is through the eye. I am Cassidy Hope and this was created at Ken Island High School through PLTW and the Biomedical Sciences Pathway. Um, to start off, Alzheimer's disease is a growing epidemic in the world's population as it ages and grows. It is currently the sixth leading cause of death in America with no definitive way to be diagnosed. Um, Individuals today who are considered to have Alzheimer's disease really are only diagnosed with possible Alzheimer's uh, until an autopsy can be conducted and fully determine it. Um, professionals struggle today to diagnose uh, <laughs> Alzheimer's disease because it can mimic other diseases in the brain and there are limited resources and research. Hi, I'm Allison Ayers, and the current ways of diagnosing Alzheimer's can include cognitive tests, performing interviews with friends and family, scans such as PET scans, MRIs, CTs, to rule out other possible illnesses. The current ways to diagnose Alzheimer's are not as effective as they could be. The cognitive symptoms, by the time they're detected, are mostly too far progressed for possible treatment options such as clinical trials. Most clinical trials are dependent on the ability to have the early diagnosis. So our innovation is the OFLA, which is a combination of the ophthalmoscope, a very common uh, thing seen for eye doctors and used by them to study depth perception, and a uh, OCT scan, which stands for Optical Coherence Tomography. The ophthalmoscope utilizes a light source, a prism, and mirrors to uh, to allow the to the, to allow the examiner to measure the depth perception of a person's eye and see like the back of their eye in the fundus area. As you can see here, the image it shows the parts of it: the viewing window, the lens indicator, reflecting mirror, and filter switch and aperture dial. So it'll produce a magnified image of the. Uh, inside of the eye in the fundus and will allow people to essentially analyze depth perception. The OCT scan on the other hand is used for the retinal scan. The OCT scan uses low coherence tom tomography to, to essentially make a, a map of the retina and like so that the doctor can analyze the width, the structure, and essentially everything else with the retina. So together these two components of the OctoScan will be able to determine if two impairments are present in the possible patient. The ophthalmoscope will determine if the front surface of the optic nerve appears smaller than normal which will conclude if the individual has eye depth perception issues and the OCT scan will analyze the mRNFL thicknesses of the patient and compare those values to healthy mean values and that will establish if the patient has a healthy or decreased mRNFL volume. And as you can see in these thickness maps here, um, it is compared between a healthy individual and an individual with Alzheimer's disease. And 
And in the color maps to the left, uh, the warmer colors indicate thicker retinal areas and cooler colors indicate thinner retinal areas, like Cole mentioned. And the individual with Alzheimer's disease has more cooler colors with less red, showing a significantly decreased um, retinal volume. The advantages of the OctoScan include, with the decrease of the macro retinal nerve fiber layer, it can be shown within the scan. This will allow for changes such as faster diagnosis along with more accurate and non-invasive. Although there are limitations and um, it might not be 100% um, accurate due to a lack of research and studies connecting the eye and Alzheimer's disease. And also the progression of the disease is different for every individual. So some individuals might not experience the same um, effects on the eye as others do. So the long-term implications that we have for this device is, the, uh, is how more material will allow for the more material and data we get from this device due to like early diagnosing will allow for more research and potential uh, analyzing of the root cause of the problem due to the early diagnosis. Other things that can happen is it could help fund, the success of this could help fund uh, Alzheimer's groups in uh, more and more ways of trying to cure it due to its success. The It'll help with It'll help replace and save money for ophthalmologists all over the world, and it can help co help uh, connect ophthalmology with the with neurologists for other diseases to research more non-invasive and better ways of discovering brain issues. So I'm Ashley Barnes, and my group worked together to create the coronal ring magnifying lens for high myopia correction. And currently, there's 5 billion people suffering from myopia. And of those 5 billion people, there's actually 65 million people who are suffering from uncorrected myopia. And that has led to complications like permanent vision loss. And 2.9% of the world's population is currently suffering from high myopia, which is myopia defined as being greater than or equal to negative six diopters. And this is basically just the uh, severe progression of myopia. So to explain myopia a little bit more, it's a refractive error. And if you look here, you can see that the normal vision, this light is focusing on the back of the eye, which is known as the retina, which is responsible for the visual sharpness and clarity. But in the myopic eye, when the eye is elongated, uh, which is known as an astigmatism, which is what normally causes myopia, you can see that it lands in front of it, causing that blurriness that is known to be paired with myopia. And so long-term implications of this is that when patients who have myopia, they go to the eye doctors to get like LASIK or get prescribed glasses or contacts, they're missing a day of work. And globally, that has added up to $202 billion uh, in productivity loss. And this basically means that the economy is losing the money when they miss the work for recovery time and stuff for those procedures. Myopia is also a gateway condition, and it can lead to other things like cataracts, um, glaucoma, and retinal detachment due to squinting and the straining of the retina. And we're hoping that the chroma lens will become a new permanent solution uh, due to its uh, customizable ability for astigmatisms, which is a condition that's often paired with myopia, as stated before. And there's also collagen te technology within our chroma lens, if Zoe wants to explain that a little bit more. And I'm Zoe Katz, and I'm going to present our actual innovation. So, like Ashley said, our innovation is uh, designed to correct high myopia, which affects um, about 224 million or 2.9 of the world's population. Um, so the chroma lens is the acronym for the corneal ring optical magnifying lens, and it is it's um, two different kinds of um, innovations mixed together that already exist. So that um, corneal ring implants exist, which are how we got the plastic polymer rings. This is our sketch of kind of what it would look like. It is a transparent lens with rings and ridges on the edges to um, push up on the surface of the cornea. And then coupled with a concave lens to um, elongate that uh, eye tissue. So that is a lot like current contact treatment. So it's more, it's a, an implantable contact lens which works to flatten and um, fix the cornea. So how it works, um, which I kind of already explained, um, here you can see on the bottom how it would be inserted into the eye. So it's inserted on the stromal or middle layer of the eye so that it put the ridges, which bump out here, 
can push up on the top layer of the cornea so that they don't protrude through, as well as the, um, the refractive layer uh, adds concavity to the lens so that it pushes that focal point back. Um, so it's also placed in alignment with the, eye, the eye's iris and the pupil so that it um, fits comfortably within the eye and anatomically within the eye. Daniel, would you like to go over the deficits of... Oh, I'm Daniel Alvarenga, and as you know, the number one most common treatment option for myopia or any eye vision problem is contacts or glasses. And with that comes many um, um, just limitations, and that includes um, them being uncomfortable, them falling out, them, you could lose them, um, you, they could break. And um, so with that comes um, replacements. You have to replace them yearly, monthly, and that will come up to a big cost over your lifespan. And another one we compared it to is LASIK. And LASIK is an invasive procedure that uses laser technology to shave off the top layer of the cornea. And with that comes more risk, um, including um, infection, um, irregular astigmatism and even irreversible vision loss. So why choose our innovation over these current ones? Um, ours is a one-time um, permanent solution. It is potentially more cost-effective since it will be a one-time um, purchase kind of thing and it will be less invasive and biocompatible. Okay, so today our innovation is a color-changing mouthwash for early detection of oral cancer. I'm Tay Tay Freeman. Um, basically, we did this because oral cancer is the 11th common most cancer in the U.S., and it continually rises because doctors tend to overlook the symptoms the patients have. They usually just think it's mouth sores or just aches. Um, the incidence rate right now is 500,373 people that have oral cancer, and this cancer is prone to people who smoke tobacco and drink alcohol. Um, it usually develops in the bottom floor of the mouth, and it usually has yellow and white patches. Um, Maddie's going to talk about how this innovation works. Hello, I'm Maddie, and as far as the innovation um, working for the patient, it's going to be rinsed in their mouth for about 20 to 30 seconds. and. While it's in their mouth, this is kind of the process this is going to take on, and it's called the ELISA, comparable to the ELISA lab. Um, first, this is the base antibody capture that is going to be present, and then the RAC1 protein is going to be the target antigen that it connects to and binds. Um, next, we have the enzyme enzyme linked detection antibody that connects to that and the color change will happen in this step which is where the substrate will turn into the product and whether or not the cancer cells are present there will be color change of like a dark blue the darker the blue is the more present the cancer cells are um, and as far as the innovation or the advantages of this innovation, um, it's determined through science, so it's going to show um, the color change based off the science of the cancer cells being present or not, so the color change will show. Um, it's more efficient than the physical examinations that doctors give out currently because they normally overlook those symptoms that are present, and this will scientifically show the color change um, physically to you. Um, it's less invasive than the blood testings as well because that's going to go like puncture skin, but this is just using the saliva biomarkers to figure out if the cancer is present. And it's also more time efficient than lab testings that normally take days to get back to you. This will only take minutes and you'll know the results. And Tate is going to take the impacts of this innovation. So overall, this innovation is efficient because it decreases the death rate by catching the um, oral cancer early on in the stages. Um, it saves on for the future medical testing because this test, you only need to take it once to see if there's cancer cells present compared to oral screenings. You usually take them about twice a month to see the development of the cancer. Um, it's, more clear, it's more clear and efficient because you know the results within minutes of the test rather than waiting for days. And you can get tests regularly because it's at your local dentist office so all you have to do is ask if you think you're at risk or they'll ask you if you want to take it um that's all <laughs>
My name's Caitlin Campbell. And my name is Catriona Wright. Oh, and we worked with Paige Elise Bennett. Our problem is to reduce loneliness, depression, and aggression in individuals with dementia. Um, patients with dementia are more likely to experience worse symptoms. So there are three different types of dementia. There is mild, moderate, and severe. Mild dementia is when a patient still has most of their memory. They're just starting to lose their short-term memory. Um, moderate dementia is when there starts to be more confusion. They need more care. Somebody might have to start taking care of them. And then severe dementia is when the patient is like completely bedridden. They have full Alzheimer's and it's like the worst stage. Um, our product targets people with mild and moderate dementia. Um, some of the problems that they struggle with is getting out of bed, getting dressed, brushing their teeth. And this graph just shows the difference between patients with dementia and patients um, who are just like regular other elderly. The Forget Me Not Bear is our solution. And this bear has an electronic pack in the center that can be removed so the bear can be washed if it gets dirty. It also has volume and an on-off switch. So if the patient thinks that the product is too loud or too quiet, they can adjust the volume. Or if it becomes triggering, there's an easy on-off. It comes with the Family Connection app, which will allow patients' family members to communicate with them. It has voice to text and text to voice so that it can go back and forth between the phone. It will remind patients of their responsibilities, so brushing their teeth and washing their hair like I had mentioned earlier, um, to hopefully help decrease the amount of patients who struggle with these issues. And it will play soothing music. We did a lot of research into current care facilities and what they do to decrease some of their problems and aggression in patients, and soothing music was on there, so it's really important to us that it includes that. Some of the long-term benefits would be um, decreasing the amount of time a patient has to be in a care facility and taking some of the responsibility off of stressed out caregivers. Um, it'll also be more cost effective because care facilities can be so expensive and if they're at home longer with the bear, it'll be cheaper for the family. The reason for developing the bear is to create an alternate solution to reduce loneliness and depression since current treatments are very limited. Um, but some of the main treatments are antidepressants, but they have alternate side effects and most patients relapse after using antidepressants. Also, antidepressants are not ideal for elderly patients, especially those with dementia. They have sedative properties in them, which reduce cognition, and the main purpose for a treatment for dementia is to reduce the rate of cognitive decline. Another treatment is doll therapy, but these have ethical concerns. The dolls look very realistic, and families feel that the patients are being lied to since they look so realistic. And if the patients were to take care of the dolls and it were to get lost or broken or dropped, the patient could be very alarmed, and that could trigger the patient with a negative response, which is not ideal. Um, patients could also do socialization and support groups, but these groups have to be, the patients have to be willing to partake in these um, groups and support groups um, to, and most patients just agree with other patients or they just sit there, they don't really part participate, so it's not very beneficial. And so the, the, the bear will just provide a companion and a comfort item for the patients while reminding them to do tasks and just ultimately reduce loneliness and depression and make them have a little bit more independence overall. I'm Tristan Germanero. I'm Nathaniel Bevins. And I'm Patricia Reyes. And this is the use of nanocellulose um, nanocarriers to treat lung cancer. So lung cancer is collectively responsible for the most cancer-related deaths worldwide, making it not only an issue in the U.S., but in other nations as well. And lung cancer is really a difficult cancer to diagnose and treat, considering that 84% of cases are diagnosed in the late stages. As you can see, in stage 3 and 4, the cancer has already progressed way beyond um, normal, and it's really hard to treat it after it's gotten that far. And lung cancer is treated using chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and targeted therapy. However, these three are not sufficient or enough, considering that they pump high levels of toxins into the body. Although they're killing the cancer cells, they're also killing healthy cells, which cause numerous issues such as hair loss and weight loss. And surgery is also used in lung cancer cases. However, considering 84% are diagnosed in late stages, um, cancer cannot, I mean, surgery cannot be used sometimes since people are old. And surgery also has severe complications, such as it can cause the loss of a lung. So we decided to innovate a nanocellulose nanocarrier to create a better treatment plan for lung cancer. So our innovation is a nanocellulose-based nanocarrier. 
So it's a nanocarrier with a cellulose envelope um, that uses ligands to target only lung cancer cells. So these ligands are molecules that target the unique elements of lung cancer cells, such as overexpressed and mutated folate receptors and overexpressed and mutated epidermal growth factor receptors. Um, it's 200 nanometers in size to maximize the retention of um, nanocarriers within lung cancer tumors. And it's delivered via inhalation to maximize the dispersal within the lungs and also decrease the immune response as it doesn't have to travel through the entire body. It's only traveling through the lungs. Um, because of this decrease in damage to healthy tissue, it reduces the adverse side effects normally seen in chemotherapy and radiation therapy such as hair loss, weight loss, um, gastrointestinal irritation, etc. Um, also, because cellulose is completely non-toxic and biodegradable, it decreases damage to healthy cells again, um, especially considering some nanomaterials can become toxic as they build up in the lungs. Um, this innovation could also have long-term implications that Patty will tell you about. As it was said before, lung cancer is one of the deadliest cancers worldwide. So this treatment will decrease the deaths by year. It will also increase uh, the life expectancy for about one to two years. And it will be also a possible cure for those who are suffering because of lung cancer. This is a treatment that will have less side effects as compared to other treatments because it will only target lung cancer cells and will not affect healthy cells. It will also be a possible treatment to treat another type of diseases or cancers. Hi, my name is Madison Weber, um, and our innovation is a therapy program for bone cancer patients with lower limb prosthetics. So with general oncology patients, when they develop bone cancer, a form of treatment that they get is an amputation. Now, with the cancer itself, they're already at high risk for medical impairments because of the cancer itself. And this can include illnesses, pre-existing conditions, infections, etc. So when a patient gets their prosthetic and they're sent to back to, ther to therapy, when they develop the medical complication, they are immediately sent back to the hospital to get that medical complication treated. What this does is their therapy gains and their progress in therapy is at risk of being lost and their decrease in functional abilities is starting to decrease. And now Alyssa will explain some of the deficits in current treatment programs. Hi, I'm Alyssa. I'm doing the deficits in current treatments and a whole bunch of deficits are developing anxiety and this causes them to not be able to be discharged in a safely manner. And those with the pre-existing conditions are not able to get the effective care and treatment in the acute rehabilitation centers. And they don't have the proper professionals in the centers, which will delay their therapy time and keep them in the facility longer. So our innovation is a therapy program that helps solve this problem. So what this will do is this therapy program will be implemented in acute hospital, hospital centers. Now the medical oncologist will be directly on site to treat any medical complications that arise. And they also will match similarly to their current treatment program in the acute center in terms of the exercises that they're doing, the duration and the intensity that they're doing them which. Now Alyssa will explain some of the exercises that will be done. Some of the new exercises include balance, arm, trunk, posture, mechanics on the actual prosthetic itself, so like hygiene, putting it on, and the coordination. Now Theo will explain the benefits with the new treatment program. I'm Theo, and some of the benefits of this uh, innovation include helping patients with the, these underlying conditions get into therapy more, and making overall the therapy program that they use more flexible to fit their needs. And uh, since there will be medical medical oncologists uh, on site with these patients, it will be a lot safer for them too, just because they're going to be already there able to treat any complications that may come up. Some of the long-term implications of this include increasing the time that the uh, patients spend with the physical therapist and, and the amount of time that they're able to uh, fit into a therapy program. And this innovation can also be used for patients who may not have these underlying conditions but still have other time, time restraints that may conflict with their therapy program. And uh, that's it. I don't know what else to do. 
So our innovation is a blue light blocking spray to reduce artificial blue light exposure. My name is Lily Dixon. Um, Ariel Avaranga. And I'm Kendall Drinker. So in today's society, there is an obvious increase in all generations and uh, students, parents, adults that are spending more and more time on electronics due to the pandemic. We have been forced to work um, online, do school online. Um, in fact, 63% of kids in the U.S. spend over two hours a day on the screen, and that's just recreational screen time. So this um, percentage doesn't take into account how much screen time that they spend for things like school. So with increased screen time comes more exposure to blue light, which is part of the visible light spectrum. It's high energy visible light. Um, and this too much blue light exposure can ne negatively impact the eyes. It can cause dry eye, cataracts, macular degeneration, which could eventually lead to blindness if it's prolonged and severe enough. Um, too much blue light exposure also affects the skin. It can cause swelling, hyperpigmentation, redness, um, wrinkles, premature aging. Um, and then too much screen time for children will impact their social development. Uh, it doesn't allow for them to have a constructive space to um, express their creativity and imagination. It teaches them inauthentic habits and emotions um, and can lead to increased chances of anxiety and depression. And then most notably, um, too much blue light exposure can impact the sleep schedule. It can uh, inhibit the production of the hormone melatonin, which causes sleepiness. Um, so without melatonin, we can't have the proper sleep schedule that we need to function and not getting a good enough night's sleep can impact concentration, it can lead to down the road possible mental disorders such as anxiety and depression, as well as poor academic performance. So we're trying to kind of block out this blue light exposure to stop these negative effects from occurring. And um, just to bring your concern over to this graph over here, this graph shows um, U.S. children and teens who have spent more than four hours a day using electronic devices in their screen time. And the red bar shows prior to COVID-19 and the black one since COVID-19. And you, as you can see from all like the percentages in the bars, um, screen time has nearly doubled, if not in all, if not all of them. And most notably, in the age to 14 to 17, which would include our high school like age range, which only further re reiterates the fact that this concern needs to be properly addressed with our current innovation. So there are a few current available options that are on the market today. There are skincare products such as, as shown here, the Super Serum Skin Tint. And that uses zinc oxide to combat for the redness, the swelling, the hyperpigmentation, wrinkles, and redness caused from blue light. Um, as shown in this picture right here, blue light is high energy visible light, and it penetrates the skin much deeper than both UVA and UVB light, which is causing all those problems, as I just mentioned, with the swelling, hyperpigmentation, um, the redness, and... Um, that is why it's been shown effective in doing so. But the skincare products can be time consuming, expensive, and it has to be applied several times per day to ensure that the zinc oxide does not wear off. And then a more common approach to reduce blue light is known as blue light blocking glasses. Um, those glasses have been aimed at reducing, blocking, and filtering out the blue wavelength light. Um, with a primarily goal of improving sleep. The problem with the blue light glasses is they have to be worn at all times, which could be a hassle to carry around everywhere you go. And it's actually less beneficial to healthy sound sleepers. The um, blue light glasses are needed though. As you can see in this image, blue light penetrates, goes through the cornea and hits the retina, which causes the dry eye and the cataracts, where UVA and UVB light just stops at the cornea. Um, this is where our product comes in. It's called the Blue Light Blocker. It's an alcohol-based spray-on protective film. It will be sprayed on all technology devices, no matter the shape or size, so such as an Apple Watch, um, an iPhone, an iPad, even a TV. And it will use uh, ethanol and water to make the base of the spray, and then it will use a component called silicon dioxide that is actually used on liquid spray-on screen protectors today, which allows... Um, the liquid to harden and go to any type of device, no matter if it's, no matter the shape or size, as it will use an ultra-thin layering made from quartz sand to do so. And then it will also use zinc oxide and iron oxide. Zinc oxide has been found effective in blocking the UVA and UVB radiation, as um, iron oxide has been more effective in blocking that blue light, the high energy visible light.
Um, they've actually been found super, they actually have been found, they work very well together as they've worked together in many skincare products. So we're hoping they will do so in our product. Um, benefits to, the, to this innovation um, would be that, like Lily mentioned, it'd be, it can be a, applied across multiple devices. Something as small as a smartwatch or as big as a large TV and it includes like phones, tablets, computers and things like that. And it's ideally a one-time use product, so once it's applied to, the, to whichever screen and electronic device you would want, it's there and you wouldn't have to go and buy, out, like go buy another bottle and things like that because it's already applied and it'll stay there. Um, the product will also um, include increased cost effectiveness, availability and accessibility to cur compared to current solutions because as it's a, ideally a one-time use product, there's no need for you to go buy more of the blue light blocking spray. So it'll be efficient in, in um, cost. And compared to like current solutions like blue light glasses and some, um, sunscreens and skincare products, it'll provide strong constant protection, which is not something you always find in current solutions like blue light glasses, which like Lily mentioned before, it's a hassle to use and you might not always have them on you. And because one of the ingredients is silicon dioxide, which is found in liquid glass um, screen protectors, which have been found to be very um, thin and as it also uses ultra thin layering it'll be thin it won't obscure picture quality and it's not a concern consumers need to be worried about and because it, it reduces blue light exposure it'll improve sleep and reduce any associated health concerns um, associated with like elevated amounts of blue light exposure and implications of this um, innovation is that it'll contribute to a significant decrease and the amount of blue light exposure around the world globally, which then again, like I said before, it will um, reduce the risk associated um, health concerns like the child development and adolescents risk to um, engagement and risk behaviors. And these behaviors include things like drugs, alcohol, things that are very detrimental to um, a kid's health. And other things are like sleep, cycle, skin, eyes, etc. And then it also inspired further and continued research on blue light technology and blue light related products because an, an, an example would be like this blue light product could also make things like blue light glasses and um, skincare products obsolete as this would provide a much better solution to the blue light concern. So more research could be done to um, and further improve upon and advance things that are already um, currently available in the market to make them better and more viable provide more of a competition to this product and it could also include policy changes regarding how to reduce blue light um, exposure worldwide things like guidelines could be um, affected with this product and it, there could also be things like the screens of phones and electronic devices could be required to have something like this already applied to them so that the blue light exposure emitted from the screen is kept min is very minimal and um, it's not a concern consumers should be worried about. Treating Parkinson's disease using the injection of enhanced stem cells. I'm Allison. The problem. Park Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder that affects the amount of dopamine within the midbrain, or better known as the substantia nigra. Parkinson's disease symptoms include tremors, slowed movement, loss of balance and posture, changes in speech and writing, rigid muscles, and even paralyzing effects. Researchers do not know why one develops Parkinson's disease, but they do believe that genetic factors and environmental factors play a role in the development. In this image here, you can see a normal neuron versus a Parkinson's disease neuron and the receptors based on how much a Parkinson's disease patient is receiving versus a normal patient and how much significantly less there is. The deficits with the current treatments. Current treatments include medications such as Lodopa and Cardopa, diet changes, therapy, and even a surgery that is a deep brain stimulation. Um, these current treatments do not cure the disease, they only help manage the symptoms and they may even cause other symptoms within the body, as well as they don't protect the neurons within the brain, causing patients to go from a stage 1 Parkinson's disease patient to a stage 5 Parkinson's disease patient. Um, Ladopa and Cardopa is the most common treatment for Parkinson's disease patients that most patients take, as, and it is a medication. Um, there is a wearing off effect after about one to ten years which causes these patients to have to change medications 
change the dosage amount of this medication or even find an alternative treatment. Um, for our first part of our innovation, it is enhancing the stem cells, which Caroline will further explain. Hi, my name is Caroline and I'm going to explain about the stem cell differentiation. So what we want to be able to do is to take pluripotent stem cells, which are stem cells that can turn into any type of cell desired, and allow them to turn into dopamine producing neurons in plentiful amounts, which we want to focus on with Parkinson's since in that disease they have the neurons that stop functioning. Um, first, our first part is what we want to be able to do is to acquire stem cells from a source. There's multiple sources we can get these stem cells from. Some are placentas, embryos, bone marrow, or blood, or just a few examples of places where we can get these stem cells. So our next step um, shown right here where the stem cells will be cultivated in biomaterials and they will be placed in a hypoxic environment. So while they're turning into the dopamine producing neurons, um, hypoxia, this process is where the stem cells are deprived of oxygen for a set amount of time, which will give them adaptive processes and promote tissue like regeneration and protective processes. The biomaterials are very important because the cellular microenvironment of a cell will control the cell's behavior and how it interacts and behaves in the body. Um, some biomaterials that can be used are laminin, collagen, mitral, and even hyaluronic acid, which is a commonly used facial product for people, actually. Um, so once they're done being cultivated in those processes and turned into the dopamine-producing neurons, our next step is the injections of the stem cells, which Dakota will explain. Thank you. All right, so I'm Dakota Nagel, um, and I'm going to be explaining the injections of our stem cells. So it begins with the location of the procedure, which is directly into the spinal fluid. Um, how does the injection work? So there's three separate doses uh, of stem cells that are placed into the spinal fluid. And how it works is the, the fluid within your spine circulates every six to eight hours. So with that being said, the stem cells, whenever they're administered, they can float and th move throughout the body to the desired location. Our desired location is a substantia nigra in the midbrain. So it's, it may be difficult to see, but these yellow and pink uh, tubes are the oculomotor and trochlear cranial nerve. And in these locations, um, that's where the dopamine neurons fail in Parkinson's. So the stem cells are desired to reach this location and fulfill their regenerative purpose and essentially heal the Parkinson's disease. Um, so what does it look like after the procedure? So one day after the procedure, uh, a patient will be monitored and data will be collected based on how they're doing. And the same goes for a 12-month process after, just to record their progression and see how they're doing. And Caroline's going to further explain the long-term implications. So like our major long-term implication is that this innovation is going to greatly improve a patient's quality of life. And just so typically a Parkinson's patient has a hard time completing daily activities and tasks such as even going on a walk outside with their family. So this innovation will take those symptoms away that the Parkinson's patient has that limits those daily activities and allow them to go again and get at those activities that they once could not. Um, another big advancement and implication is that it will allow an advancement in different treatments and studies done for different diseases such as like Alzheimer's disease and other neurological diseases. Um, it will do this by using the research and methods from this innovation and the information we've provided and then giving them new ideas and opening new like doors and opportunities for them to look at our research and using theirs. And our final like long-term implication is it's going to eliminate the need for drugs and other treatments that Parkinson's patients normally have to do. As said before, like the Cardopa and Ladopa dopaminergic drugs will not need to be used anymore if this innovation is successful. Our benefits and advantages of our current treatment and why it's better than other out, other out there will be explained by Dakota. All right, so the benefits of our innovation uh, begins with no medication is required and it's, this, it's really about the simplicity of what our inner innovation does and what it covers. Uh, there's one procedure. Now that does have some sort of uh, gray area because 
there is severity with Parkinson's. Some are a little bit worse than others, which may mean that they need more than one procedure. So, in addition to that, um, with our innovation, instead of it being like a medication that just suppresses the pain and the, the symptoms of the disease, the stem cells will completely get rid of the disease and make it not a problem or a part of your life anymore. Um, there's one procedure total, um, with the exception of there being physical therapy or visits, because Parkinson's patients uh, may need to relearn how to walk and stretch and throw a ball or walk with their dog. Um, and the last aspect is how cost effective our work is. Um, the upfront cost is to be determined. However, it is far cheaper than what is already out there. Paying for a med medication for one to the rest of your life, one to 10 years, uh, can really add up in price. And the same goes for, for physical therapy or a dietitian, you name it. This is essentially one type of procedure with physical therapy and everything else for a very minimal amount of time. So that is all that we have for you. <laughs> Are you sure? I believe so. Okay, so this is our poster for Prosthetic Sleeve Restore Sensation for Upper Limb Amputees. I'm Mackenzie. This innovation is surrounded by the problem for pros of prosthetics for amputees. They're undesirable and they lack a realistic experience. Amputees find the look of, pro of prosthetics undesirable and they're unsatisfied with the look and aesthetics of the prosthetics. So our innovation, uh, I'm Jordan Hunter, our, the innovation itself is called the sensory sleeve and it's made up of three main components which is the silicone glove, the external stimulator, and the spiral cuff electrode. Within the silicone of the silicone glove there are temperature and pressure sensors embedded into it which receive sensory information from the ex external stimuli while the user is wearing it and it sends information to the external stimulator via Bluetooth where these impulses are then converted into electrical signals that travel up wires into electrodes that are implanted in the ulnar and median nerve which are the main two nerves within the body. From there, these impulses travel up the spinal cord into the somatosensory cortex of the brain, where it is perceived as sensory information. I'm Caroline Clemis, and some of the additional problems, other than uh, aesthetics that Mackenzie mentioned, is how when someone doesn't have sensation in a limb and they just have a prosthetic, uh, there's a danger there if they were to set their arm on a stove or close it in a door, uh, there's, uh, there's a risk it puts the amputee uh, in danger. So we're helping, hoping to address that as an issue, uh, as well as enhance the dexterity of the amputee. Uh, they, won't be, uh, they won't have to think about the maneuvers that they're making as much. Uh, they will just be able to do it, such as maybe opening a door, shaking someone's hand, um, less dependence on that visual stimuli there. Um, we're also hoping to reduce the overall prosthetic rejection rate, which is up to 42 percent, um, as seen from a recent study uh, on a big demographic range of amputees. So the biggest thing with our innovation is that there is no commercially available uh, prosthetic restoration device out there. This would be the first theoretical uh, innovation. So someone who wants to have their sensation restored, uh, this is now available for them to do. It would be a purchase and a procedure and just that uh, physical therapy learning how to use it. So we hope to address some of the biggest problems in current prosthetics today with our innovation. So thank you. Okay, so our innovation is Heart Healthy Food Bar Powder and it is by me, Juliana Bigum. This is Ariana Sosa and then Madison Peters. And our problem is that there are about 700,000 deaths per year caused by heart disease and about 650,000 of them or more are caused by bad dieting and obesity and obesity is also caused by bad dieting. So heart disease leads to heart attacks, strokes and artery disease or artery failure which also causes about 1.5 million deaths per year. 
And our goal is to go in and stop this from happening. We want the American population to start eating healthier because they do not eat healthier enough. And the heart needs oxygen and nutrients in order to function properly. And due to blockages caused by bad cholesterol, which is the LDL cholesterol, it cannot receive the oxygen and nutrients it needs because of the blockages. So the long-term implications of our food bar will be that there will be less cases of heart disease coming in and out of the hospital every year, which also in turn means that there will be less deaths caused by heart disease every year. We also want to possibly influence other healthier brands to decrease their prices so that they can compete with our low prices, making more people choose to eat the healthier options than the cheaper, unhealthy options. So, guys, so the purpose of our innovation is to decrease the number of cases of heart disease, heart disease per year. The only thing is, is it does exclude those with heart defects because those can simply only be fixed with surgery. But if they do choose to consume the bar, it will help ease the symptoms of it, which shown in this picture, it has the plaque blockages. It will go in and it'll clear all of the plaque out, which current um, things today do not do that. It just helps the plaque blockages. It doesn't clear it all out. So there are multiple different forms of the bar, which can be eaten at breakfast, lunch, dinner, dessert, whenever you choose to eat it. And they all contain the same amount of the powder ingredient, which will be discussed later on. And it only includes foods for the food section of the bar that improve blood circulation and help the health of the heart. And some of the ingredients have antioxidants in them, which are a very important role in this food bar because it protects the cells against free radicals which go in and they damage the cells because they are looking for electrons, as shown in this picture, that are unpaired, and they pair with them damaging it. So we want the antioxidants in our bar to help decrease heart disease. So aside from the bar, within it we have this powder. The powder includes medications like statins, which lower your LDL cholesterol levels. It has clopidogrel, aspirin, and warfarin, which prevents blood clots within the arteries, as well as ACE inhibitors, which reduces your risk of heart failure, as well as um, reduces your blood pressure. So some deficits and available options. There's so many things that you can do to prevent heart disease. There's so many lifestyle changes you can make. You can eat healthier, um, go to the gym. There's many diets that you can do, like the Mediterranean diet, the TLC diet, the Ornish diet, and the flexitarian diets. While they do work and they show very impressive results, diets aren't always the best case because not everyone can be loyal to a diet. Approximately 45 million Americans go on a diet each year and 95% of those diets tend to fail. Once one is on a diet, within one to five years after um, going off the diet, all that lost weight comes right back and then you're right back at square one where you're still having all those heart problems, the breathing problems, high cholesterol, high blood pressure and all those things. Um, dieting and going to the gym can also cost more. Dieting can cost approximately $2,000 more a year because of all that organic food and stuff that you would have to buy for meal plans and certain meals within that diet. The gym, that can cost money because you have to get a gym membership. And the gym isn't always as effective because sometimes you don't want to wake up too early in the morning to go to the gym. After a long day, you don't want to go to the gym. You just want to sit down and you want to relax. Aside from those two things, there's angioplasties that you can get, which is where a stent is put into the vessel to clear, to help clear with your blood flow. Some disadvantages of that is that it can cause infections due to um, the stent and it can cause allergic reactions because of the medications as well as blockages of the arteries and more blood clots. So the benefits of our innovation will be that it will be an inexpensive, easier way of eating healthy and dieting. There will be no meal prepping required as it will be a quick on-the-go thing to grab. Um, they will taste good, so they will be taste appealing, so people will choose these hopefully over more unhealthy options. And of course, they will also be good for your heart, circulation, blood pressure, and um, cholesterol levels. Um, all of this is um, benefits because of the ingredients in the bars, including vegetables that have vitamin K in them, berries that are high in antioxidants, uh, avocados that is high in potassium, and chia seeds that are high in omega-3. And that's all. Maddie Peters. Juliana Bigham. And Ariana Sosa.
Hello, my name is Callie Mammis and this is Emily Maglia and we, our project is Lax Locks, which is a device that will, the strings on the lacrosse stick go into and keep the strings in tension while the sport lacrosse is being played. It can be adjusted and it has a removable top so that the strings can be pulled out and in whenever they are choose to be. Yeah, I'm Emily Simaglia. I'm working with Callie. And so the main problem that um, we're trying to solve is keeping a legal depth of a lacrosse pocket. So if you're in a game, you always want to keep that depth at a legal level. Otherwise, for example, um, we were actually playing in a lacrosse game and one of our players had a illegal stick and they actually had to take a point away from us because they scored a goal with an illegal uh, depth of their pocket. So that's um, kind of the issue we're trying to solve. So we want our device to be able to keep those strings in place at the legal level. So that is uh, the main uh, part of our pro uh, project that we have. And now I would like to take you through all of our pro prototypes through what they are going to use. So we first started out with this boxier design as you can see in my engineering notebook over there. We we made it as our final concept sketch which is what we we're going to start with. And obviously you can't trust everything you start with. You have to progress through and see how you can make things better. So we then determined that we could use more of a sleeker design and have have it fit more conformally to the lacrosse stick. And then we started to realize the problem, how are the strings going to be able to be removed from it? How are they going to be removed if you have this smaller design? So then we had to shell the inside and make it hollow. And then we moved on to, we, we could do it better. And we added a hinge. And that is how we got to our final prototype, where the strings go through, clamp to the axle, and you can turn the axle and adjust it and the face comes up so you can pull the strings out and it is connected through a hose clamp that is easily adjustable that will make it so the device can be put on any lacrosse stick that you choose on. Yeah, so we wanted to make sure that our device is able to fit onto any type of lacrosse stick because there are different brands. You have the SDX, you have the Under Armour, um, so we wanted to make sure that we were able to expand our market as much as possible. We want to be able to sell our device to any lacrosse player with any type of stick and that's why we have um, this adjustable clamp right here. Um, yeah, and that is our uh, project. Thank you for stopping in. Hi, my name is Isaiah Schulteis. My partner couldn't be here today. His name is McLean Mogul. Uh, this is our pacer bot. Uh, the concept behind this car is that we would stick this onto a 400 meter track. Uh, it would use this line follower right, right here to follow one of the lines around and you would program it to go a certain distance at a certain time. Um, a runner would follow behind it, chasing after it and uh, uh, to get a specific uh, time that they're looking for. Um, the idea came from uh, for the Olympics and the pro track meets that they have. They always have uh, pace setters that go out before them, and since I'm a runner myself, I thought that'd be a great asset to have. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, it's kind of difficult to have a person next to you, uh, so we would have uh, a, a pacer bot instead, so it would be safer and uh, probably more efficient to have some type of uh, mechanical uh, thing like that, so that's what we went with. And you need one per uh, meet, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so you would uh, just take this, what you would do is at the beginning, uh, before the race, you would go ahead and program it and then uh, it, would, uh, it would run on completely independent during the race and it's the runner's job to keep up with it. So today we have a problem with glasses fog, okay? So largely, considering the pandemic, everybody's wearing masks recently, okay? Um, people who wear glasses consistently are finding that their glasses are fogging, and a recent survey that was conducted found that 40 out of 48 people find it highly irritating that they have to constantly be readjusting their face mask to, you know, stop this fogging. And the majority of those people also found that it impedes their work in some way. So, what we have here as the solution to the problem is a cover of the face mask. So it will have two layers to it. 
One will have a hypoallergenic medical grade adhesive tape that faces towards your skin. What that does is it creates an airtight seal against your skin. The layer will then roll over top of the mask with wire um, skeleton inside of it. And what that does, it'll make it malleable for the user to mold properly to your own face shape, making it more ergonomic. Okay. Um, the goal was to have a non-adhesive, you know, uh, non adhesive thing to stick to your face, however, there aren't many things like that that will actually uh, be compatible with facial oils. So, what it turns out to be is that it, it's, it really is at this point just one and done. Maybe you can use it a couple of times. The adhesive will wear off every once in a while. You will have to get more, making it less environmentally friendly. However, ignore that. Um, we do have the possibility of having a new malleable polymer. So this was researched about five years ago by Wei Zhang. Um, unfortunately, it's not commercially available right now. Um, but basically what it is, it's a malleable polymer. There we go. It's a malleable polymer that you can actually reheat with just the heat of a hair dryer, really anything that you have at your house, and you can mold it to your face shape without burning your fingers, similar to how like you boil mouth guard and then put it into your mouth and mold your teeth to it. Um, what that does is you can mold it to your face shape, and then you can do that many, many different times. Okay, so that will reduce um, like having to change the wire in the mask. So Though the adhesive makes it less environmentally friendly, the malleable polymer will make it more environmentally friendly. So, this or that. Um, one more important thing is the cost. So the cost is going to stay pretty low compared to like um, clip-on sunglasses or the spray for lens cleaner. Uh, a lot of old uh, patents for th solving this particular problem have found that they like to do things where they change the actual lens of the glasses. So what that means is they add like a anti-fog thing along with your choice of getting an anti-glare or anti-scratch when you buy your glasses. Okay. The good part about this particular design is that you can buy it anywhere. Right? You don't have to go to a specific spot to buy this. You don't have to wait two weeks to actually get it back. And it's less expensive. It is entirely unreasonable to expect a person to buy another pair of glasses just for the fact that they may be able to have anti-fog possibilities. Okay? So this design overall, very good idea, does stop fogging in the glasses. My name is Leah Peck. I am a high school senior at Kaim High School. All right. Hi, my name is Rebecca Ritz, and I am one of the biomedical science teachers at Ken Island High School. Today, we had the pleasure of having our students be able to present their innovation projects for the biomedical sciences as well as the engineering pathways in uh, Project Lead the Way. Our students have been working all semester. This is the capstone course for both the engineering and biomedical um, sciences pathways. And our students have been working all semester really hard to come up with innovations, do the research behind, to make sure the science supports the innovation that they have developed, um, and come up with a great presentation for uh, thankfully parents as well as administrators, faculty members, support staff um, at the school and across the county. So we're very thankful that everybody was able to join us today, especially you Mr. Strait, um, coming and recording all of our students and the amazing uh, projects that they have worked so hard to develop throughout the course of the semester. During the semester, do, you, do they check in with you uh, for the progress of the report, of the, of the project or what? Yeah, so our students have worked since day one in the course. Um, the biomedical innovations class is the fourth class in the, the 
four course pathway. Um, and since day one, they've been coming up with their idea, with their, um, they, they formed groups, and they've been doing all the research behind it. They do, they have been working on this all semester, and in our class, uh, so in our class together, our class time together on Google Meets, um, we have breakout rooms where they met daily with their group, their group members in order to develop their projects together. Um, it was really challenging this year, obviously, being virtual, then partially in person, then some in person, some at home, uh, but they overcame some crazy obstacles to be able to work collaboratively with their group members to, to develop just fantastic projects this year. There are literally life-changing projects here. Yes, yeah, so they had, you know, we had uh, innovations discussing, you know, the, the use of nanotechnology in treatment of cancers, treatment of HIV, um, some life-changing innovations in terms of early detections of various diseases, um, you know, treatments for uh, different conditions uh, involving the human body systems, uh, like the eye, and using um, different types of technologies, as well as um, different innovations that may prevent, um, preventative uh, types of, of innovations. Um, you know, so the Blu-ray Blu blocker spray to try to prevent and um, prevent the Blu-ray exposure to, to individuals. So a lot of really, really neat innovations that all of our students came up with. And I didn't mention all of them, so I apologize. Um, but yeah, different types of therapy programs, uh, lots of different really neat innovations that our students came up with. And a lot of times their innovations came because they had an interest in that particular um, topic. So they formed groups based upon their interests, based upon maybe personal experience or family members who were affected by this, that, or the other thing, um, or just a natural curiosity in that technology and the advancement in, in biomedical sciences. Uh, so we've had some really great uh, innovations here today. Super proud of all of my students and all of Mrs. Sutherland's students um, at how well they developed their projects, how hard they worked all semester, as well as how well they presented. Um, you know, I know they were very, really nervous, especially those once the camera got in front of them. Their presentations changed a little bit. Um, <laughs> But overall, they, they're a fantastic group of students. We couldn't be more proud of them. They've worked hard this whole pathway um, to you know, come up with this great idea, the great ideas that they had today.